looking at the demographic changes worldwide over the rest of this century, if population is power, then there is a fear among those architects of the global order. If they are no longer the most populous, is it possible for their power and that order to be challenged in the future? I'm Isha Da Vinci. This is The Grift Podcast, conversations to get you ready for the future. On this podcast, we've been talking a lot about how technology is redesigning the future. But technology is not the only exponential force that is massively impacting the world. Population growth and decline are quietly reshaping the power that nations have or will have in the 21st century. While some nations are aging rapidly, others have populations that are young and growing. I wanted to understand how these trends are changing our environment and what it all means for you and me. In this episode, I chat with Dr. Jennifer Schuber, one of the foremost experts in the field of political demography. She's the author of Eight Billion and Counting, How Sex, Death and Migration Shape Our World. Her articles have been published in The Atlantic, Harvard Business Review and The Washington Post. Her recent TED talk, The Truth About Human Population Decline, has been viewed over one million times. Dr. Schuber is focused on educating the broader public about the importance of population trends. In her work, she argues that a deeper understanding of fertility, mortality, and migration will help us to make the right kind of investments to shape the future that we want. Dr. Schuber is formerly a tenured professor at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee, one of the nation's leading liberal arts colleges. She has studied at the Max Planck Institute for Demographic Research in Rostock, Germany, and served as a demographics consultant to the U.S. Office of the Secretary of Defense. She's a member of Phi Beta Kappa and the Council on Foreign Relations, and is vice chair of the board of the Population Reference Bureau. She received her PhD and MA from the University of Maryland and her BA from Agnes Scott College. This conversation flies by. We discuss which countries are growing and which are declining in population, the impact of demographic changes on society, the challenges of aging and shrinking populations, the rise of sub-Saharan Africa, migration, rethinking work and education in an aging society, the role of artificial intelligence and robotics in addressing labor shortage, the gender imbalance in birth rates, the role of technology in shaping human relationships, and what we need to do in a world that will soon look very different. Let's dive in and get ready for the future. Jennifer, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you. I've been so looking forward to this conversation. From what I understand, demographics are a big, big deal in shaping the future. And this podcast is all about the forces shaping the future. So excited to have you here with us. You're a demographer. What does that mean exactly? What are you studying? What are you researching? And why is it important? So specifically, I'm a political demographer, and that is an important distinction because um, I am trained as a political scientist, but I'm a political scientist who uses demographics to understand the world. And I think I could, of course, couldn't do anything that I do without the work that demographers do in, you know, thinking about how how many of us there are, who we are, how we got to where we are, who will be in the future, uh, understanding all that in down to all kinds of amazing detail. But what I do because of my disciplinary training in political science is I put it in a context that addresses the kinds of questions that uh, people who focus on politics and economics are thinking about. So I'm more in terms of, you know, if I use demography as a lens through which to read the world, I always say that it it leads me to ask different questions about the world than I would otherwise. And it leads me to come up with different answers to other, you know, to, to questions about peace and prosperity, the kinds of things we ask all the time. So I see a demographic lens as really useful for that. And, you know, the, the part of the title of my book is How Sex, Death, and Migration Shape Our World. And you hit on that in your intro. It is, this is a key force to understanding the future. Without it, you'll have an incomplete view. But of course, by itself, it's not complete. So before we dive into your work and what you're telling us and sharing with us about the future, about populations, how they're changing the world and the impact they have and how we should prepare for it. I want to know a little bit about you and your journey to becoming the person that you are today. Let's spend a little time getting to know you. Well, I think 
it's important to know and uh, that I kind of came at this first from the environmental perspective. So as a kid, I was one of these real go-getter kids who started an environmental club in seventh grade. So let's see, this would have been barely into the 1990s. Um, so thinking, you know, that's been an undercurrent in my life, real interest in the environment. Um, we called it the Environment and Environmental and Animal Preservation Association. That's what we had named it. Um, and that, so that's that I'm carrying with me into my interest in international relations. And so I go on in college to study international relations. And specifically, um, I chose probably from a lot of Michael Crichton movies, Japanese as my language to study. I think that's another important ingredient um, that is going to clearly lead to where I am today. So I've got the sprinkle of environment. I've got this interest in Japan, studying the Japanese language, uh, which I have I ended up abandoning because it's so hard, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and um, I also got exposed to a lot of uh, issues with gender and migration. And um, and so all of those things kind of coming together for me, I was also remained interested in national security. So you, believe it or not, those things are actually all connected and they're in the work that I do today. So, uh, you know, there were always bookshelves full of Tom Clancy at my house growing up. And then, you know, this specific time of thinking about the economic competition between the U.S. and Japan, and then that long love of environment. And I went to a women's college. And so there was that gender lens as well. And so it wasn't really until I got to graduate school in political science where I wanted to study non-traditional security, meaning when I looked at the world and I asked my advisor this specifically, I, um, I went to a small liberal arts college in Atlanta. Uh, there were no graduate students there. I didn't come from a family where anyone had really been to graduate school, so no knowledge about that. But I just said, are there people who study underlying causes of war and peace? And I mean, like really underlying, such as the environment. And she said, sure. And so you should go to University of Maryland. That would be a great place for you. And that is where I went to get my mm. PhD and um, was exposed to this idea of population aging kind of early on in my studies. It was something we barely talked about in the world. We're looking at, you know, the year 2002, where the oldest countries in the world were Germany, Italy, and Japan, and they had just achieved this median age, which was something I'm sure we will talk about a lot, of 35. Now there's over 60 countries with this median age of 35. But I was just kind of an early adopter to this idea of aging, and, and with Japan being the vanguard of that, it fit naturally with my interests. Give us a day in the life of. What I want listeners to really get is a sort of understanding, a little window into your world what you're doing, what you're thinking on a daily basis when you get up in the morning, what are the lenses through which you view the news and the world and what you're thinking in your daily life? So just give us a little taste of that. It'd be so cool. Sure. Well, I think for me, the biggest thing, and this probably resonates with a lot of listeners, is it doesn't matter how good the work you do is if you're not good at communicating it to the world. And so I did have a career in academia, tenured professor, um, was in academia as a professor for 15 years, but so much of that work, you're not rewarded for your ability to share that and communicate it. And I have a really strong desire to see the kind of work I do make an impact in the policy world. And so I, I felt pulled out of academia a couple of years ago. I mean, I was also part of this pandemic midlife stew of folks who left what they did and tried something new. Um, and I've always been a writer. I considered myself a writer. And so I spent three years relearning how to write to communicate that way to a trade audience. So when I get up in the morning, I don't only just think about the research itself. I focus a lot on how to communicate that well um, and in a way that resonates with folks. Because from a scholarly perspective, frankly, we are light years ahead from the, um, the general population in thinking about things like population aging. But there are still people out there who have not grasped that that is this trend that is defining the future. And, and that is why I want you here, because that is so true. There's a huge gap between what's happening and what people are aware of. And I think that's, in the, on this podcast, we talk a lot about technology or what's similar with technology and with population change is 
these are exponentials, things that happen at an exponential rate. And they sort of quietly are happening and nobody's aware because our brains don't sort of think in an exponential way. Whether population is growing or declining, it's happening exponentially. That's why I wanted you here. I'm like, this is a force that's changing the future. People need to know there's such a gap. We go along sort of just blithely unaware of what's really happening, thinking that what we see is real, but it's not. In the, in the opening few lines of your amazing TED Talk, which has yeah. over a million views, you sort of talk about the fact that that what we see is not what's, it's, it's already over, right? Let's just talk a little bit about that. In terms of population, what we're seeing versus what's really happening. Yes. And I think this is, um, it's really important because, so I released a book, this for a quick context, I released a book called 8 Billion yeah. and Counting um, in March, 2022. I was floored that when people, when I would go to talk to people about the book, they focused so much on the 8 billion part and the counting part, like the fact that we were growing. And the number one thing I heard from people was the world is overpopulated. What are we going to do? I can't believe it's 8 billion. And there's so much more to population than that. In fact, there's there's one chapter about youth and it's still important. So d don't get me wrong. It is still important. But I said to myself, OK, I'm, I it looks like I might have an opportunity to give a TED talk. I have 10 minutes to tell a clean, quick story. There can't be a lot of nuance in it. You can't cover all eight, all eight billion people. So what is the one thing that I think people have not grasped? And it is that fundamental change. So the way I talk about it in the TED talk is, uh, you know, I took astronomy for my one science class as an undergrad. So I, I did take something from it, right? Yay, liberal arts. And I know that when we look at the night sky, we were taught that it takes so long for the light from those stars to reach us here on Earth that what we're looking at may not even exist anymore. And that became a way for me to think about explaining what's going on with world population. So it's common, and I start most of my presentations this way as well, to look at when did we hit one billion? When did we hit two? And the tremendous growth in global population last century from 1.6 billion at the beginning to 6.1 billion at the end. But what we see that on the surface, and there are all these cartoons from the 60s and 70s, political cartoons that would be on covers of magazines that would just show tons of people piling on the earth, kind of the height of this environmental awareness of that mm -hmm. time. But what we don't see are the tectonic forces beneath. And so the growth rate of the global population has been declining since the 1960s, since the time when we were really focused on that. And so we're we looking look at, at numbers, the average number of but we're not looking at the rate of yeah. growth or the rate of change. Not the right mm -hmm. number. Exactly. That rate of change matters a lot. Um, and in fact, it's astounding how rapid the rate of change is, even in the individual countries yeah. today. Uh, so we've got the global, if we're zoomed all the way out, you know, sure, we will hit 9 billion people probably. But after yeah. that, you're not looking at 11. Yeah. You're, you're done yeah. on 11. And so if you really put it in context, I am not that old of a person, I don't think. And I've seen us hit five, six, seven, eight yeah. billion. So to think about adding two more billion is a, I, I wanted to just be a wake up call to say, this is not infinite. Yeah. You think it's infinite because you're in the middle of it, but it's not infinite. So you're like there waving a flag and saying, hey, people, wait a minute. This is not what you think it is. The yep. future is very, very different. We need to be thinking about that. We need to be planning for that future, not what we thought it was going to be based on this other trajectory that we had in our minds, but doesn't really exist. And we've seen all the all the countries where th that had the wrong projection in their minds and what's happened to them. It's a devastating. So I'm going to come back to all of that. Let's go back to you for a second and really give people, I want people to understand like what you're thinking about. When you get up in the morning and you face your day, what, what, first of all, what sort of concerns you most? These days, what concerns me the most is the reaction that's happening to people who are getting the message. So, you know, I I talked a bit when we first sat down here about how important it is to communicate data. I think that that's, that's part of my, my career calling is to communicate this. 
But what I have learned is that you don't get to control what happens once you've communicated that. So I could tell you one figure, and in fact, this would be a great experiment for your listeners. Here's one number for you. The total fertility rate, which is the average number of children born per woman right now is 2.2. Some of your listeners are going to hear that and say, thank goodness it was so much higher than that just a few decades ago. Isn't this great? A different listener is going to be, you know, in their car or on their treadmill and say, isn't this awful? What can we do to raise that? So it's really not just about those numbers. And what makes me nervous these days is I've spent a career trying to draw attention to the importance of demography, but there's no control over how people are reacting to that. So I have some real concerns about um, folks who might be willing to go to all kinds of lengths to change those numbers. And we've seen this in the past, right? We've seen uh, forced sterilization. We've seen policies to limit the number of children to bring those birth rates down. Right now, we don't see a lot of coercion to bring them up, but it has happened in the past. That came up in the TED Talk as well. This idea of, you know, in Romania, Nicolae Ceausescu did that. A quarter of our countries in the world that are old, that are aged, they're not democracies. And so I really do worry that the effectiveness of raising awareness that that the future will look different could play out in people's extreme focus on changing the demography instead of on reacting to the population as it is. And yeah, be. and in the TED Talk, you were really sort of wanting to calm people down and and, and help them to guide them to a, a proper understanding or a more holistic understanding of what these figures mean and how to respond to them in a healthy way, not some sort of knee-jerk reaction in either direction that doesn't lead to anything positive because people could really do stupid things. So let's let's dive into the work. Demographics are powerful, powerful things. We are a planet of humans after all. And while we like to get caught up in technology, in new things that we create, in stuff, we're sort of obsessed with stuff. The truth is, it's all about the humans. Based on your research, what does the world look like in 2100? Well, the great thing about demographics is that the people of the future are already born. So we, the people who are living in 2100, a lot of them exist. Uh, Probably my kids uh, will, will be living in the year 2100. I most likely will not be living in the year 2100. Um, But we do know that we will have a greater, smaller world because that is math. So that's, you know, that is part of what I want people to understand that even if the birth rates start to go up because of math and the size of cohorts and this exponential growth and the, the, the population momentum towards shrinking, we have a greater, smaller world in 2100. Now, world, that's going to, you can use that with some air quotes. It looks really different around the world. So if I had 10 minutes, like I did in that TED Talk, to tell you a story about world population, I'm only going to tell you about the trend you may not know about, which is aging and shrinking. Over 30 countries already shrinking. China is shrinking. I mean, India will be a shrinking country by then. This is mind-blowing. So um, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that's the case. They've already peaked. The number of entrants into the workforce year on year has already peaked. That has happened. So for much of the world, we are headed towards really rapid population aging. The number of shrinking countries will increase. But... There is an area of the world where we do still see high fertility rates. It is very few countries now, but again, math, these are some big countries. So if you look at some of the, some of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa, kind of right around this middle belt of the country in the Sahelian region, we do still see uh, five or more children born per average, uh, born, excuse me, we still see five or more children per woman born on average. And while we have every reason to expect that to continue to decline as the century goes on, that means that you see tremendous population growth in those countries. So if you're zoom doubting, you're thinking about what does the world look like in 2100 from a labor force perspective? Where will the world's labor be? Where might the younger consumers be? Big chunks of them are going to be in sub-Saharan Africa. I want to read you a few headlines and, and get your reaction. Um, 
this New York Times article, July 16th, 2023, how a vast demographic shift will reshape the world. And then uh, a little bit under that was, by 2050, people age 65 and older will make up nearly 40% of the population in some parts of East Asia and Europe. Um, extraordinary numbers of retirees will be dependent on a shrinking number of working age people to support them. So I think of those two headlines as two different things. One of them is the way I would probably phrase it, which is look at the proportions that are changing. The other one goes ahead and makes an mm -hmm. assumption about the, the um, individual mm -hmm. who is older in that mm -hmm. society, meaning they will be retired. And it makes an, a very important mm -hmm. assumption about the structures and relationships of transfers in that society. So this is an assumption that in all of our old countries, demographically old countries, workers pay for old people. And in a, in a lot of cases, that's true. I live in the United States. We have what is called a pay-as-you-go system. The current working population pays into a pool from which you know, entitlements for older people are drawn out, healthcare, social security, et cetera. There are lots of countries like that. They are not all like that. And I think that's an incredibly important distinction. I talk about this to the national security community a lot because they're interested in, you know, two big competitors uh, for, for the U.S. and Europe on the scene, Russia and China. The systems are not set up the same way with the same social contract between the government and the people. And, you know, there's diversity around the world around that. So I think, well, at the same time, I appreciate the use of alarm. It is important. And in fact, when we're talking about a communication standpoint, you can, you're can you going to watch my career over the next 10 years and I'm going to get more alarmist and I'm going to get that way mm. on purpose. Um, but it if you can get people's attention and then give them the nuance, that's important. But that we, we often miss that second step in the media. It's just, well, the world is going to end because the you know societies will become yeah. extinct. That is a phrase that is given yeah. all the time. Well, that's yeah. not true. Yeah. They'll look yeah, they'll look different. I think we want to talk about the cultural shift that that comes as dem demographics change, and that's sort of inevitable. That, and and I think that's what a lot of people are concerned about. This is from Newsweek, four days ago. China said to lose sixty percent of population by century's end, and a little bit more on that. China's population of over one point four billion could drop sixty percent by the end of the century, according to a Chinese think tank. By twenty one hundred, the world's second largest population could number just. 525 million, the Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences has predicted. Okay, what, what, what do you think about that? Yep. Yep. That's and that's accurate. It's easy. Very easy. Because all you do is you take, um, the way I like mm -hmm. to do it is I like, there are different projections on birth rates. There's, there's a projection that says if they go up, if they go down. I like if they stay the same. Because what you really want to know is if nothing changes, what's in mm -hmm. store for us? Just math says if nothing changes, this is what's in store for China. Do the same for Italy, same for you know South Korea, etc. Um, you know what what the future holds. Now, the most important we keep focusing on the size of countries because it's shocking to think about a population shrinking yeah. for because of a long term reason. I mean, we know that we've had different. You know, Jared Diamond writes his whole book Collapse. Yeah, right. We understand that there are times in history where this has happened, but this long term actual shift towards shrinking populations because of birth and death rates. That's hard to grasp. What we need is a second headline to go with that that says not only will China's population shrink, they will be a lot older. older. So it's a lot of nuance there. So it's not just like this doesn't mean X and that doesn't mean Y. But we've been sort of accustomed to thinking because of the exponential growth in population in the 20th century, yeah. we've been accustomed to thinking that it'll continue to grow. And what's clearly happening is in the 21st century, populations are going to decline. Yep. Okay, so another another headline, Japan's shrinking population faces point of no return. This is 30 2023. Japan had, a major, had the first major shift. By 2013, a quarter of the population was 65 and older, making Japan the oldest large country ever. Soon, much of Western Europe will follow with record old age populations, South Korea, Britain, and Eastern Europe will be next, along with China. Thoughts? That's right. Yeah. Yes. And what 
we need is an add on to that that says, and how are you preparing yeah. for that? Because what seems to be happening is when when folks I talk to receive the message about population aging and potential and you know future shrinking, they say, "How do we fix it?" Population then becomes a problem to mm. be solved. Even if these birth rates go up in the short term, as I said, they're, the population doesn't it doesn't change. So you know, for the next couple of decades or much mm. longer, you this you have this shift. This shift is certain. Mm. The shift is certain and it's permanent. So. I want to see if we can start some real conversations about how to build resilient societies in that. I like the language from from climate change with this, actually, which is thinking about adaptation mm. and resilience. Mm. You know, if you if you uh, if you live on a coastal area and the sea level yeah. is rising I, and it's starting to lap over your yeah. ankles when you're standing in your front yard. I hope you don't just say, how can we change climate change? How can we stop climate change? And you don't do yeah. anything else other than think about that. I hope you put some sandbags yeah. out and I hope you build your house up on some stilts and deal with what yeah. you have at the same time that maybe you think about the underlying structures. But we are not doing enough of the building the house up. On so there's stilts. a short term response and then there's the longer term thinking. Would it sound like to me if the yeah. if the water's coming in lapping around your ankles, no, 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 then I mean, you put the house up while you plan for the further <laughs> further down the road. But it may be hard to put the house up, and I think that's the situation. And honestly, really, why are we not doing more to be resilient in the face of aging? Because it's mm. hard. And here's where I like to be a political scientist because it's politically hard. So I, you know, I love my economist mm. friends. But they are not all that useful when it comes to putting in action the types of solutions needed. They might say, ah, if you raise retirement age by X, Y, Z or change this rule. But as a political scientist, we know that's really hard. I mean, look at France. Of course, this is the, the easy example. But, uh, you know, they tried to raise uh, retirement ages yeah. what, for some of their, you know, blue collar workers. That girl from, had such a backlash. You know? Poor guy. <laughs> I feel so bad for him. Such yeah. a backlash. You're talking about what was it, you know, up 57 to 59, maybe. So that yeah. is not, that is not resilience. Let's just go back to China for a second. China had a one child rule for a long time. And, mm -hmm. and then now they're seeing the result of that. If they didn't have that in place and allow people to just have babies as they wanted, if they didn't try to engineer things, do you think they would be in a better position? That is a great question. And there's actually way more to the answer than you might think, because in really nearly every country that I ever research, there is some demographic engineering that mm -hmm. goes on. So that one child policy was one example of decades of thinking about how to engineer a different population. And that has happened worldwide. So it is a tough answer for us because um, and I actually wrote about this a little bit on my newsletter this week. If you think about what leads to low births and you're, you're up here at the societal level, policy is part of that. So state policy. So something like what preceded the one child policy was the later, longer, fewer campaign in China to try to space births out. State policy matters mm -hmm. when it comes from high fertility to low fertility. But even without state policy, we see a shift in our modern times towards valuing smaller families, having smaller numbers of children, getting married later or not at all. And so we also have plenty of examples worldwide where those values and cultural shifts are taking place even without state policy. And in fact, if you really start to break it down in China, you see that urban birth rates were already low before these things. Because you know what? You ever tried to yeah. live in a city and raise a kid? Yeah. yeah. It's much yeah. better, right? So there were already these rural urban divides. So, you know, really to say, what would it look like? It would still be low. It might even be as low as it is today, but they would also have 30 million more yeah, women. Uh, that's you know, another, that's the, that's would. the other, that's the other, the birth ratio, <laughs> sex yeah. ratio uh, thing at birth. That's yeah. a whole other conversation. We'll get to that. Okay. So, yeah. so I'm thinking, so China is on, on track, <laughs> To, to have a population of 525 million, a 60% drop. Mm -hmm. Do you think, I mean, is a 
totalitarian government. We know the CCP. They do whatever they want. Aren't they going to try to do something about that? They're not just going to sit by and let this happen. What are the, what are the, what are some of the strategies and policies that they're going to employ in order to try to change that and expand the birth rate? What they've done so far is, uh, I have heard some things anecdotally, but I'll go with what I've read that's more official. Um, they are working on trying to get young people married because it's still taboo to have children outside of marriage. So that means if you want more children, you need to work on mar uh, on marriage rates. They're also promoting a really traditional um, division of labor between men and oh. women, asking women to go back into the home, get out of the workforce, oh. and stay home to raise kids. Now, so the face you're making, you know, I'm a woman. It is tough to put that genie back in the bottle. So part of the reason it is so low in China and, uh, you know, around that region actually is the the pervasiveness of those patriarchal gender norms. They're leading some women to reject the system completely. They're like, man, if I'm going to get married, that's what marriage is going to be like. I'm going to be in charge of all these things. I don't want to do it. What makes China's response interesting is they're doubling down on that. Now that could work, believe it or not. So sometimes when we look around the world, we see those societies that have a really clear distinction um, let's say very traditional gender norms and the, and it's a clear path for both of them, they often will have higher fertility than in societies where women, uh, quote unquote, can have it all. Because as we know, you cannot really have it all. So that actually can end up pressuring it lower. You know, trying to work and, ha you know, have children or trying to have a high pressure job and lots of education, that can actually kind of pressure it down. That was like a U-shaped curve there. So do I think it's going to work? I do not think it is going to work. South Korea has a really big problem as well. And they've tried to do things and it just has not worked at all. And young people are just not having children at all. Yeah, they're just, they're just not. It's, it's really low. Is this, is, this, uh, is this a factor? Is the more educated, the more sort of intelligent people are saying, no, 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 I'm not bringing children into this world. And everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing it. So I actually do get that. I get that question mm -hmm. all the time on podcasts. Mm -hmm. Is it the case that it's the most educated? Mm -hmm. I think it's the most telling right now that everybody's so economics. Power. Really? They wish it was economic because if it was economic, you could probably so fix what is it. it? What it really seems to me is shift in values and culture. And now values and culture do change. So that's global. Other than in sub-Saharan Africa, which we will get to in a minute, this is sort of a civilizational trend, global civilizational it trend is. that we're like not going to have that many babies. That's just it. Yep. And, you know, I can't boil it down to one and no one can. That's why I said it's like this low fertility mm -hmm. stew. You've got, there. you know, our costs up? Yes. But when you've tried to put in policies that change mm -hmm. cost, give people childcare, it doesn't change wow. anything. Um, or it changes things at the margins. It doesn't change the trend, the whole trajectory of the trend. And of course, in you know country X, it'll be a little more of this one. In country Y, it'll be a little more of that one. But there does seem to be something about our society today where there it's more individualistic. Maybe that's it. We're more focused on technology than on community. Mm. That could definitely be it. Um, and there's there's just a shift in the way we live and what we mm -hmm. value away from kids, wow, raising wow. kids. And, you know, I'm painting with broad brushstrokes yeah. here, but that's what we're doing, right? We're talking macro trends. Yeah, we're talking macro trends. Um, I've seen talk about artificial wombs um, on tech Twitter. What, yeah. is, this, is this a thing? Well, this is where I think it matters. Uh, two things mm -hmm. matter. How much alarm is there over population and who is alarmed? And then what kinds of checks and balances exist in the society? Mm -hmm. I get to be a political scientist here against that. Now, here's the here's something that may surprise you about mm -hmm. this. Um, things like in vitro fertilization and freezing eggs, there are a lot of restrictions against that in low fertility societies, such as some societies in East Asia. You That'll would be the opposite. The yeah. opposite. Right. Yeah. Like, hey, whatever you want to do, let's just have more babies. But that's not the case. It's not just have more babies. It's have babies within a certain type of, of uh, structure, a married, you know, heterosexual uh, partnership, 
So that seems to be oh. valued. I also think it's, um, you know, a lot of folks in the kind of tech sphere that you are around mm-hmm. all the time, they are concerned about the future of population. They've got money and they've got tech. And so I think those folks are probably out there doing all kinds mm. of stuff with, with uh, trying to figure yeah. that one out. <laughs> there's, the, um, I, there's another headline. So. Politics. Yeah. So the rules mm. matter, right? Like we can't just right now have artificial mm. I mean, I, so I live right next to Alabama. And this week, the uh, state Supreme Court of Alabama, I think, was saying that um, frozen embryos are children. So that would go against right. the whole trend toward yeah, artificial yeah. wombs. So you know, they're the pol- that's why I say that it's about the technology mm-hmm. and it's about the politics. So we're going to have older, smaller populations in the developed world. Mm-hmm. There's some interesting headlines that I want to talk about. The Washington Post, Africa's rising cities, how Africa will become the center of the world's urban future. More than eight out of 10 people in the world will live in Asia or Africa by 2100. Most of the world's population growth over the next century is expected to come from Africa. Um, And then growing at unprecedented rates and shaping and shaped by forces both familiar and new dozens of african cities will join the ranks of humanity's biggest megalopolises between now and 2100 several recent studies project mm-hmm. but that by the end of this century africa will be the only continent experiencing population growth 13 of the world's 20 biggest urban areas will be in africa up from just two today as for more than a third of the world's population so at a global level, humanity is not going to lose numbers. We're going to have enough numbers to sustain life on Earth. But if some areas, some continents, some cultures are going to be lo- losing populations at dramatic levels, so we have China, we have Japan, Korea, we have um, Europe, mm-hmm. and then others, other centers of other civilizational thrusts or trajectories are going to be expanding and growing, we're going to see a shift overall in global culture where the demand for products and services um, for everything, our our supply chain is sort of driven by demand and consumption, um, which countries, which areas want what, and then what are the tastes and preferences of this particular area, blah, blah, blah. So if we have Africa rising, then the tastes and in predilections and interests and demands of, of sub-Saharan Africa is going to dominate global production forces, I would think. Overall, planet Earth, we have enough people. It's going to be fine. We're going to top yep. out around 2100. Yep. It'll stay around 10 billion. It'll sort of plateau out at, at that point. But how that's, the makeup of that 10 billion is going to change. Right. How do you see that impacting the globe, what we do as a human race, mm-hmm. different cultures within the human race, how they bounce up against each other. I mean, that's what people are really scared about. I think when right. I mean, Elon Musk says falling birth rates are a threat to humanity. It's a threat to Western civilization. It's a threat to a certain kind of humanity. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm agnostic about all of it because I think all people are people. And yes, I'm, I am a Western person. I like Western civilization. I like Western culture. What's the soup here and what's going on? Yes. I mean, I think you, you, you've hit the nail on the head. So, you know, you can give one number and people have two different reactions to it, right? Here we go again. And so the, the one that if you tell people that, you know, actually not only does the global composition of where people are from change, but then you can actually bring it down to, you know, the the composition of of races in the U.S. changes. You don't get to control how people react to the data, right? You don't get to control what people think about it. And yes, some of the reaction, some of the fear around aging and shrinking is not just the aging and shrinking, it is the change. And so we have operated in the past with two very powerful ideas that really shape I think, where we are today. We've operated with two powerful ideas. One of them is that population is power. 
We have believed that to be the case. And so at the end of the day, even as we've seen technology change the battlefield or, you know, level the the space around there in the world, there's still an, an ingrained belief that population is power. And that comes partly from looking at the world's most populous countries and, and, and alliances. I think the other is we've operated with a very powerful idea that economic growth is infinite. And if we just do everything we can, we can keep playing in and and grow forever. And so looking at the demographic changes worldwide over the rest of this century, if population is power, then there is a fear among those architects of the global order, because these are the countries that used to be the most populous and they wrote the rules of the global order. If they are no longer the most populous, is it possible for their power and or that order to be challenged in the future? Now, here's the political scientist in me who says, maybe not. I really think those rules were written in a way that, I mean, think about even things like the UN Security Council. As long as I have been studying international relations, you know, 25-ish years, the question has been, when will we have to see reform in the UN Security Council to take account of the fact that these are not necessarily the most important countries in the world anymore. And it's not happened yet. So what has to happen? That's the better question to ask if you're an analyst. What has to happen to change the rules of the game worldwide? To elevate these growing countries, the ones that will be the populist centers in the future. What has to, how does Nigeria gain power in the world? That's a good question. That's what we need so, to ask. I mean, I was pulling some notes and I, I thought it's now's a really good time to sort of talk about it. Uh, I have a table of the, the world's 20 larger cities in 2100 based on protected populations. Lagos, Nigeria. Right now, in 20, this was 2015, 13 million, extrapolated to 2100, 88 million. Kinshasa, mm-hmm. uh, 11 million to 83, 83 million in 2021. Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, 73 million. So Kinshasa is Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, 73 million in 2100. Mumbai is fourth, 67 million. Delhi, 57 million. Khartoum, 56 million. Naomi, which is Niger, 56 million. Dhaka, 54. Kolkata, 52. So Kabul. So India and Africa, Karachi, 49. Nairobi, 46. I mean, it goes on. On top 20, like not one of them. It's Cairo, Kimpala, Manila, Lusaka, Mogadishu, Addis, Addis Ababa. So not one of them outside of most of them in Africa, a few in India and uh, and some in Southeast Asia. That's it. And um, and so you you said what needs to happen for let's say Nigeria to say well, now we have the most population in the world. We want more impact. We want more say in, in global conversation. In in we want to be part of the G seven. We want to do this. We want to do this. Yeah, I mean, nobody gives up power. No, yeah. people don't relinquish power. For no. nobody gives up power no. if they don't. If they cannot give up power. That's like not even yeah. like nobody yeah. gives up power if they cannot give up power. That's a human, ingrained human trait because they want to have a seat at the table. So maybe they'll have to expand the table and say we have to yeah. let you in. Or is what's going to happen? Um, it's just people living in these countries where their populations are growing, but they find that they don't have room and rights globally. They're not part of the global conversation. They're like, okay, I'm just going to move to a country where I can have more impact. I mean, is, is migration then going to become, migration and immigration going to become even greater from the populate, the countries where the population is growing to the countries where the population is declining. Is that likely from what you're seeing? Is that going to be a massive trend over the next 50 years? No, it's not. Uh, I think the people who answer yes are often migrants themselves and are around that. And that feels like the norm Mm. to them. But the truth is that since the 1960s, fewer than 4% of the world's population is, has been migrants, right? Uh, You know, at, at the stock at any one given time. And I always say migration is much more of a political issue than a demographic one. And again, I think this is where being a political scientist is helpful. Economists will, off some economists, uh, will often look at these numbers and say, ah, yes, uh, 
country like Japan will have to open yeah, to migrants yeah, in yeah. order to sustain its labor yeah, yeah, yeah. force. Right. So if I'm a political scientist with a highlighter, I'm not highlighting two words yeah. in that. They are have to. They don't have to do anything. It is political. It is a choice. And, and have so they, has Japan question, opened up? I mean, you know, Japan's highly insular society, no. blah, blah, blah. They have, and, and they have a massively declining population. It's an aging population. It's a real problem. They, what have they done? I mean, they, they do open up to some migrants to fill certain skills. Uh, you know, care work is one of these. Um, yes, there is some migration, but I think... That, I don't think that's what people are talking about when they ask the question the way you did, which is, you know, do we see mass shifts of people just like we do with supply and demand? Is are, are humans just another commodity when it comes to supply and demand? And the answer is no, they are not just another commodity. Humans are not another commodity for supply and demand because it there are we live in a world of sovereign states. And so we have borders that are really quite effective. And I'll even say this as an American who's seen lots of folks coming to the border. They are effective at, at shaping the population. They also become a political tool there. And so the question then we should ask is, do we see over the next several decades, politicians and people who support them with a greater willingness to open borders? What do we mostly see in the newspapers? We do not mostly see that. We see actually a lot of pressures toward closure, some xenophobia. And I'm going to be agnostic about that too. It doesn't, doesn't really, I don't, I, don't, I don't care what the choice is there, but it's just about a political observation. And so, you know, this was one of the trends that I, I laid out for 2024 in my newsletter as well, is that we will see more populism. We will see more voices pushing back against the against migration and against change because, again, it's not just population aging. It is also that in many Western countries, the oldest generations were the most ethnically homogenous, and you see a lot more diversity at younger ages. So, it, again, you get to this idea about existential change. Mm. If population decline is unavoidable in developed nations, then is is the solution more artificial intelligence, more robots to do the work? I mean, is that are you seeing? Are you thinking or seeing that that will be how how we solve the the labor shortage? I think of it as a a menu with lots of options mm. on it but you're going to need to order more than one course. So, you know, it's the same reason that you can't say, ah, yes, Japan is shrinking. Therefore, they must open their borders to migrants in order to fill the labor force. Migration is one of the items on the menu. You might decide to order it. You might uh, decide to take a half portion or, you know, just a certain, have it flavored a certain way. You know, you can choose how you want to bring in migrants. And we actually have lots of examples around the world. I mean, some of them restrict human rights, but of different types of migration schemes to bring folks in. Also on the menu is technology. And, and it has been. And, and that's great. So to some degree, AI robotics, they will offset some of the losses from population aging. We also need to think more about engaging older workers. That is huge. And I think this is the number that when I, you know, we talk about data communication, when I was writing that TED Talk, I was looking for different ways to crunch the numbers that I thought would have mm. impact. And I crunched it in a way that was new to me and still blows mm. my mind, which is, you know, we talk about migration so mm. much, but there are like 200 million more people between ages 65 and 74 than there are migrants globally. This is just people between 65 and wow. 74. And I think there's going to be, I think I say this in the talk, there'll be over 800 million right. of them. I know about what yeah. year I said. I no longer, thank goodness, I no longer have that talk memorized. But, you know, it, maybe it was 2050. That yeah. seems like something I would have said. That is a huge number when you consider how small then the number of migrants is worldwide. So we also need to order a little bit from that and talk a lot more about old Well, workers. so... That's sort of in the aging bucket, because what is aging and what is old? And I mean, we have 30 more years of good life, maybe 50 if we do it properly, right? Age 50 is like 30 or 25. 50 is like 25 used to be maybe in 1950. Like you've People in the 50s now, they're, they're look, they look young, they act young, they are young. They're, 
like 50 is young, so 60 is young, so 70 is young. You can be working until you're 80. I mean, we, this is the whole question, our presidential candidates. It was like, oh my God, they're aging, they're too old. And maybe we're going to be seeing people in their 80s doing things and maybe even 90s. So that's a really, that's a, gr that's a great response to this whole lack of. It's like retirement maybe yeah. will not become a thing. And if people can use large language models and artificial intelligence, and they could be doing so much more, so much longer. Yes. Yes. And I, I think we have such a, such a rigid view of what work mm. is that is left over people all the time, you know, they, they'll criticize the retirement system as antiquated and that those ages were set before life expectancy was even that long. I think it goes well beyond just thinking about retirement. I think work, the mm. idea that I am, if so Here's an example. I have my dear friends have high school age children. They are trying to help them choose a path in high school because yeah. they have to that will set them up for college and the rest of mm. their career. We're talking about 14 yeah. year olds and I'll do the same yeah. thing. Right. But because that is the way it is done. My yeah. goodness. Don't we need to be rethinking yeah. everything. everything about our working life and our education? Our edu you know, and I do. That's moving. Though. It's mo I do think it's moving. I think it moved out of necessity a few years ago. This whole like everyone must go to college when the costs got crazy. That moved it yeah. a little bit. It, it. So maybe we're at this this spot now where there's an opening to think yeah. about how do we upskill, how do we reskill, how do we prepare for three different yes. careers, and they don't look the same. And so I'm not probably not going to be able to do the same work I'm doing right now when I'm 85. But I'm not worthless. No. I hope that there are some things that I'll be able to do. And it's also doesn't look the same for everybody. And, you know, I think about, you know, your listeners and who would be listening. It's, this is probably the right conversation for yeah. this group, but we should also make sure we mention that some people are not healthy. I live across the border from Mississippi. Some people don't live a long time. They can't work late in life. And so, you know, I think it's about that flexibility yeah. again, who can, who wants yeah. to, and how do we, you know, make sure that everyone has that opportunity? So the ways of thinking uh, that sort of dominated our education system, our working lives, which came from back in the 50s, no longer relevant. We have to come up with much more flexible ways of just the lenses that we sort of put on the whole thing and, and give ourselves more options, many, many more options, sort of tailored bespoke options. Like each person would, yeah. should be able to design their journey, their interests, their career, what they can offer the world, the value that they bring, and for how long they, they're able to do it. That should be an individual thing. And, and we shouldn't try to just yeah. lump people and say, oh, now you should retire, or now you should do this, or now you're too old to be valuable. Yeah. And I think what becomes hard about that is that there's, there's this relationship between the individual and the structural level. And so, you know, we've talked a lot about the structural level and now we're talking about the individual mm -hmm. level, but it's still the case that in some contexts there's mandatory retirement and those are the rules yeah. of the game. So the individual might be perfectly fine to keep going, but the rules of the game shut mm -hmm. them out. Or, I mean, there could be, you know, there's zoning laws against multi-generational housing in mm. some places. So there's both the individual and the structural. And I think it's useful for us to keep looking both. at both and kind of ping pong back and forth. Yeah. Um, so I, I find that, you know, among our, 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 our yeah. peers, there is a much greater interest in longevity yeah. research and healthy yeah. living in working later on and letting that work change. Um, so, so that is important. But I think we might often forget that the the average worker may not even have the opportunity to stay on at their firm. I mean, this is still the case. And, you know, I said I was interested in Japan from an early age, learning so much about mandatory retirement in Japan uh, over the years. And so when you're you're forcing people into just certain boxes at work and maybe you don't let them take a dip in title and pay at a, at whatever age they want to do so, or come on as a consultant instead. So, you know, for us to understand that there's a lot that can be done at the company level that reflects those structural barriers and breaks those structural barriers down. And that can then allow the individual to choose their own adventure. Yeah. I, I love it. Let allow the individual to choose their own adventure from my perspective, how people will shape their lives as we move forward. I think people are going to be much more entrepreneurial. 
they're going to look at, even if they have a stint at a company, they're going to think, oh, I'm going to spend five years at this company. But they understand I'm just popping in for a while. I can help them with, with this particular kind of role. But I'm going to then be moving out into doing this and this and this. Just open your mind to possibility and being willing to sort of say, I can create something that works for me, that fits my interests and my passions and my abilities that's going to be a much better way for humans, individuals, to approach this journey. And then that will redound to the benefit of society as a whole. Um, but, but of course, companies need to bear that in mind and make more sense. Come on, these are individuals. Everybody's path can be different. Let's, make, let's treat people as individuals and work with them. Funnily enough, as much as I'm not, I'm not like, oh, gung-ho AI, but I think it can be useful in this way. Yes, yes. The use of robotics now... On the one hand, it could be really helpful in the more advanced nations, more developed nations, where we're going to see population decline. But, but it could be a negative in poorer nations where people need jobs, like labor-intensive jobs, to emerge from poverty. I think you talk about this in the book. What do you, what do you say to this? I do. Yeah, and I think it connects to, you know, when we're thinking about where are the places in the world that will be growing for the rest of the century, they are, you know, many of the countries in Africa are in that. I think it's a danger for us to assume that they will then become the economic centers right. of the world. And I'm, I'm afraid that that is what we're doing is we're saying we're go, we're clinging to that old population as right. power narrative again and saying, oh, because they will be growing and they will be, quote unquote, the world's workforce because they'll have the youthful population, that they will be the economic centers of the world. But there are a lot of things that that give pause to that. Um, one of them, as you mentioned, is what does development look like these days? We had this model in the past. When you think about China, for example, they, oh, well, you have your greatest asset. You have lots of people, of people who can work yeah. in jobs. And we think about, you know, industrialization, manufacturing centers, et cetera. Is that model still the path mm. to development these days? If it's not, and instead it's something like, you know, maybe knowledge or service, then you have to say, do, are those structures mm -hmm. in place in these countries so that we have a very well-educated workforce that can fill those needs globally? I think there would be some question about that in a lot of places. And then you need political stability. Mm, yeah. I mean, political stability is really useful for economic growth. And you growth. also talk about and when, when the average population is very young, then political instability yeah. comes along with that. Yes, you are a much higher risk of political instability when you do have rapidly growing populations very, that are yeah. very young. And a friend of mine has a, a paper out um, about a month ago, maybe, on coups, just running mm -hmm. the numbers on coups. Your likelihood of a coup is just so much higher. So when we think, you know, what will happen with Niger in the next mm -hmm. 10 years, if you're just a betting person, you should bet that they'll have another yeah. coup yeah. or two or three. Right. And that's because, let's say, average population, 15 years old, not enough opportunity for the ch young people. Uh, they don't have jobs. Opportunity. They don't have hope in the future. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yes. And so, you know, it's very, uh, it's, I'm sorry, it's not a neat and clean story to yeah. tell about it, because if it was, we'd have maybe yeah. world peace. But we do know that when you have folks, young people who are hopeful that they will be better off than their yeah. parents, and then they're not. Or if they have a low opportunity cost of joining a rebel group because they don't have a job, they don't have money, they're maybe not even married to have like kind of that social yeah. structure, then your opportunity for joining a, a, you know, onto revolutionary, it is higher. It's not a guarantee though. And I think that's the other thing, you know, when we think about where can we find the hope in all of this, not every youthful country in the world is unstable or has seen a coup or has, you know, exploded yeah. into civil war. And so I would love to see, I mean, I don't really have the time to do it right now. So somebody else should do it. Focus more on if you've got a pair of countries and the dog barked in one and it didn't in the other, instead of looking at the one where it did bark, look at the yeah, one where yeah, it didn't yeah. bark. What yeah, made the difference? Yeah. But I mean, if we're thinking in the tech world, I think mm -hmm. in the tech world, if we're looking at, if founders are looking at what are the markets, what are the populations yeah. that need to be served? Uh, what are the populations that are underserved and that can be served by technology that would allow people to fulfill their potential, which is always what I'm thinking it should be, not let's create some technology to, to suppress, oppress, or addict a population, yeah. but rather let's create some technology that allows people yeah. to chart better lives, to fulfill their potential, to do something cool, to allow their creativity to flourish. Um, then we should, you know, all of these tech centers 
in, 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 the, in the more developed world could be looking at a sub-Saharan Africa and say, we're going to have a massive explosion in the next 50 years. This is going to be the incredible demand. And um, that means good business, right? So good business. Yeah. How can we serve these people? Most of these people have internet access. They have, have a cell phone. They may have water, but they have this. What can we provide for them right. that will change their lives and, and thereby change their communities, their countries, and the world? My big thing is, Humanity is comprised of people. The more people fulfilling their potential, the better the world is. If you want to solve a global problem, give people stuff that makes them fulfilled, creative, engaged, doing something that they love. And they won't have time for war or chaos or doing bad things because they're so busy doing what they love. If we have technologists yeah. who are like, okay, let's let's take care of this, then, then that, that may be a very good sort of win-win scenario. It could be. Absolutely. And, you know, if you think about it, I always have a tendency, and this is the wrong tendency, to say, well, would they have money to take advantage of this if we can't have this stability yeah. and peace and all this stuff? But you know what? That might have meant, I mean, thank goodness I didn't have to place a bet on it. I might not have predicted that there would be, you know, what twice as many cell phones in Africa as there are people or, you know, whatever the statistic is. But, but technology allowed that kind of yeah. leapfrogging and it made it cheaper. And so I think that's where we yeah. have to look. I, I'm with you. And, I, and you know, it, it makes me think, you know, is it the educational yeah. opportunity that yes. comes in? Is it the ability to say, well, we yes. don't have, I mean, even Zoom, so yes. we're connecting, you know, via the internet right now, you can bring expertise oh, to yes. places that do not require you to get up and move. So that, you know, maybe this is something to think about with our migration yeah, part as well. Is it, you know, and think the other way around. So think about, you know, are there engineers living in Germany who's, they're aging, maybe they are not even allowed to work given the system or able to work, but maybe they zoom in and provide really necessary yeah. skills in Kinshasa. Yeah. Jane, Jane Goodall has suggested that one of the causes of climate change is too many people. And I know this, what she said was misinterpreted and also, I'm not talking about that. And that the best way to fix this is to sort of, sort of manage growth or do something more intelligent. What are your thoughts on this? Because clearly we now we're not on this crazy trajectory of like 20 billion people. Expatiate on this. So two things come to mind. One is that's fixed in some ways. In the grand scheme of things, if you are someone who was worried about overpopulation mm -hmm. from a number of people, for the most part, my friend, that mm -hmm. is fixed. Globally, we're going to top out no higher than 10 billion. Maybe not even mm -hmm. at that. I would actually guess we probably won't even reach that. Okay, if you're still worried about it and you know that many parts of the world are shrinking, then you become only worried about population growth in those few countries where it's high, which is in sub-Saharan Africa. So then there can be a whole nother layer of things that maybe you're worried about when it gets to that. So if two out of three people on the planet live somewhere with below replacement yeah. fertility, you're talking about the places, yeah. the other places. I think the real danger for us, though, is in assuming that fewer of us or slower growth in the number of people equates to a cleaner environment. Mm. That's the danger. And so I find the overpopulation talk actually lazy. It's an excuse for inaction because if the problem is overpopulation and I have only had zero children or one child, then it is not my problem. It yeah. is those people yeah, over yeah. there. So I think it can be just incredibly problematic rhetoric and doesn't really fix things in rhetoric because I think it's kind of okay, lazy. Got it. Love it. Um, so I want to touch on before we end sex ratio at birth. Biologically, more boys are born than girls. This is just a fact. That's just out of the womb straight without anybody doing anything. And then there's this massive preference in so many countries for boys over girls. And we've seen like such skews in the population. Um, I want you to talk a little bit about this because this whole conversation going on about male loneliness and I think a lot of people want to say it's a woman's problem or it's a woman's fault. They're, women are not doing enough to assuage the male loneliness problem. I'm thinking, is this, this might just be a demographic issue. And I, was, I wanted to ask you, what's your take on this? I mean, it's po it's probably both. So I think we might might have to separate out. There are, I'm going to say, we might have to separate out mm -hmm. context, although it is, it, again, we've been zoomed yeah. out in this conversation. It's easy to see some commonalities even when yeah. we zoom out. So, you know, often when I'm talking about mm -hmm. demographics, 
whoever I'm speaking to, not you, but it, they, uh, many males will say, why aren't women, fill in the blank, getting married more, wanting to partner up with men, having more babies, getting different kinds of jobs, staying at home. You fill in the blank, whatever it is that you're concerned about. It's why aren't the women doing it? I think what's often missing is, is the situation of men. And so they're at the same time that women may be opting out of marriage. There are some men who are also opting out on purpose. That's different than the loneliness, you know, yeah. you know, like, oh no, I couldn't find yeah. someone. Um, there are men who are opting out. There are men who want smaller families or don't want to have children at all. So that's one yeah. bucket. Now, what you and I are skating around here is that there are some factions who are really concerned about um women's rejection of some men. Um, that is another bucket. And then there's one more bucket, which is maybe, you know, take all the, the that type of politics out of it. But there, you know, I look at work by Richard Reeves, for example, who I, I admire that work to put the focus back on some cohorts of men in the U.S. and say, they're actually not doing that great in school anymore. And women are eclipsing them. And he's not saying we should bring women down, mm -hmm. uh, which there is a bucket of people who say, let's bring the women down. He says, let's get the boys up. And I wonder about that from a demographic perspective, because we do know that a lot of societies have something called hypergamy, where women want to marry up. They prefer to marry up. So when women are doing well, then partnering can become difficult. And then you can just follow that trail down to maybe all the way to birth rates. Unfortunately, most of the conversation becomes, how do we bring the women down? Or what's wrong with women for not wanting someone yeah. who's, you know, makes less money than them? Why is that the conversation? Instead, it should be, how do we bring back up whatever proportion of our society is, quote unquote, failing? How do we yeah. bring that up? Yeah, I and it's not zero sum. We have such a zero sum mentality that if, if a man wins, a woman yeah, loses. Yeah. If a woman loses, a man yeah. wins. It's not. It's, it's, we need, we to, need get to get rid of that. that. In those countries where there's a huge gap, so where the the that sex yeah. birth ratio thingy is like for every 100 women, they're like 120 men, some insane numbers. There are going to be a ton of men who could not for the life of them within their society or nation find a wife. And that's because of yeah. demographic engineering or parental preferences and literally aborting the female fetus. What, yeah. you know, what are your thoughts on that? Because it's a, to me, when I look at it, I'm like, holy crap, that's a big problem. Yeah, it's a, it's a big number. And, you know, there's so much to it. A, the answer is we do not know because for all that we think, we, we've not really seen this before. And, and there are some, you know, researchers who are, who are friends of mine who've tried to look at other points in history where this has kind of been the case, but, but putting it in our, in our modern context, we've not right. seen it before. So the simple answer is we don't know. I mean, in the mid two thousands, when we were starting to notice this, this about China, there was the assumption it would lead to civil war in China because it'd be just millions of untethered yeah. young men. I don't really think that's no. the case. I think that's kind of been, you know, why would that be the natural thing that follows? There have been, you know, looking at uh, in South Korea, for example, I've looked at some of the migration laws about bringing in brides from abroad. So that is part of it. So one type of migration is the international bride market. Um, you know, that matters. We do have, you know, some folks who are moving or uh, so migration to go for working. You know, you might go abroad to work in an oil field you know, in, you know, Kuwait or something uh, while you're young. And then in that case, you're taken out of that market. So kind of like I was saying, there's a menu of things when you have population aging, there are a bunch of factors that will dilute some yeah. of the discrepancy, yeah. but at the end of the day, it'll still be millions of people there um, who millions of missing women and the, you know, course, even in the, the case, because yeah. let's say, yeah, let's say they went to some other country. There, there's, there's still less women than men in every other country in the world yeah. for the most part. But when women get old, as the population ages, yeah. there are more older women than older men. So maybe they'll be, yeah. I don't know. It's just interesting to watch yeah. because like you said, it we've is. never seen this before. Yeah. Yeah. I think what, I, I think where I get hung up on it is I know it's incredibly important and we should draw attention to it because also it is an example of demographic yeah. engineering kind of gone wrong in yeah. some cases. But 
when we're looking for what are the societal implications Mm -hmm. in political science, you're looking for, you know, how does this affect Mm. peace? How does this affect prosperity? And the answer is it may not affect either of those things. It may just purely be at the societal level, which is still of interest well, yeah, to I'm lots for, of but folks. Then, yeah. But so political scientist, political demographer, that's that's exactly right. From my perspective, I really am about human potential. Yeah. A lot of men out there are going to be miserable. And what are we going to do about it? Yeah. Yes. Yes. There are already these apps that are being created for relationships. So probably they'll end up having a relationship with an app, having a relationship with with some AI. I'm not kidding you. Yes. That's literally what's going to happen. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's whether you live in a country with a skewed sex ratio at birth Mm -hmm. or not, you're starting to see some of that. And I think that's really, you know, to kind of bring it back full circle to thinking about what has changed. Is it just the cost of children? Is Mm. it just that women are more educated now? No, there's something else that's changed in society that does pressure birth rates lower. It does pressure marriage rates lower. And, And it's, we do have this atomization for all that we are connected. We have such an atomization of us in society that we, there's just less of this community aspect. And I think it really matters. I mean, this, we see this, um, anybody who has teenagers today, you know, they, when do you have your first kiss? You know, their teen pregnancy is down. You know, that's part of the reason fertility rates are lower as teen pregnancy is down. We're supposed to think that's a great yeah. thing, right? Because we worked so oh, yeah. hard on teen pregnancy. But it also means people yeah. are not having because sex Because that's, when, you, that's when, so, the, when the hormones are raging, when, it, when the first 15 years of hormones is when, yeah. So relationship building. So, you know, hey, tech sector, come on in and let's think about how to have real in-person relationships. Mm. Well, that's a tough one for tech if tech is, I don't know. How do you have these analog relationships? Yeah. One of the interesting things that I'm seeing is that virtual reality is going to become more and more of a thing. And that's good and that's bad. Um, it's good because now we can have really amazing connections with people from all around the world you never would have before. It also means you can walk in the shoes, experience the life of, of someone you would never, ever know. Uh, you can experience things you would never possibly have experienced in the physical. Even if you went there in the physical, let's say you went to Pompeii and walked in in Pompeii, Um, we could only see what exists now, but a virtual reality could recreate Pompeii as it was, the best of our uh, knowledge. And then you can experience Pompeii as it was and prior to the volcano, blah, blah, blah. Um, So virtual reality, it's coming. It's coming. It's here. Apple Vision Pro. It's going to be a next explosion. It's the next platform on which Hundreds and thousands, hundreds of thousands of apps will be built. I don't know. All sorts of things are going to happen and that afford humanity all sorts of experiences. So the question is, will this technology interfere with organic human relationships and or not? And I think it will do both. It could, let's say it connects you with someone living in, in Shanghai and you form this incredible bond in virtual reality with this person. It's like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. I really love this person. But now you have to do the job of physically connecting with them because then you will not make a baby in in virtual reality. Exactly. Hello. Exactly. There is one important part of this. Right. And so the question is, will people substitute virtual relationships for the physical relationships? And and they, they may. I think we have to, for people like me, it's a job of can we cultivate a more sophisticated technology user. Can we get people to say, I am choosing to use this technology because it can enhance my experience, my human experience in a particular way, but I do not want it to sort of erase the true value. I want to add to my human experience, not detract from it. And I think I want people to sort of understand, like I have to, technology is here for me to use, not to, for it to use me. Big questions up in the air on and what percentage of the human population will actually become masses of technology and what will merely become pawns in the in the big tech game. That's a good one. I mean, this is also a great argument that that we need to be more social scientists in Silicon yes. Valley. You just let us know. I'll connect you. I'll find somebody for you. But because, yeah, it's really about, you know, some people are going to use it great. Mm-hmm. And we've seen this with video games. There's great yeah. research like, oh, this could yeah. be so wonderful. But how do you kind of plan for those who are not? Who become addicted to technology and substitute it for a, a lived organic human experience. Um, and, and I think in terms of population growth, in terms of people finding relationships that actually are not just maybe emotionally satisfying or 
even spiritually satisfying, but are physically satisfying? I think this is the question. And I think, look, many people will say, and many, many technologists will say, we don't care. Who cares? As long as they're satisfied and they want it, that's my job. I've done my job. I've created something that entertains, excites, fulfills people at a certain level. Who cares? Population is going to decrease, whatever. A couple more things before we wrap up. What should people prepare for? The individual listening to this conversation, what should they be preparing for in their minds in response to changes in population? And then what's one thing that they can do that specific after they hear this that they should do or you would guide them to do in order to expand their thinking? I think prepare for, again, we know what's coming. So, you know, I have kids who are in elementary school right now. I can think about what they'll look like when they get into the workforce, right? So, so much of the future is baked into the present when it comes from demography. Uh, So what I can prepare for, I'll tell you what I think about. I've been saving for retirement since I was in college. Um, There's some privilege in that, but also I'm talking, I would save pennies at a time. And it's because I started, I looked at the numbers and I was like, that's interesting. I feel like I should probably prepare for this because, you know, looking at trends. So you think about, you know, how will you can prepare for what will the rest of your life look like? Are you investing in your health right now so that you can have that longer working life that you may be potentially forced into, depending on where you live? Um, You know, are you thinking about your you know, keeping your skills up. I I wrote about this in a newsletter too, that a fascinating study out of the OECD that part of it was, you know, what rules do employers have that maybe prevent people from working when they're older? But the other part was what are older workers not doing that could keep them in the workforce? And even starting at my age, actually it was right around my age, it was a real unwillingness to upskill and reskill. It's kind of like, man, I feel like I just got out of college. I'm in my forties. I don't really want to have to learn something else again. Like, shouldn't I be able to ride that a little longer? And the answer was no. So, you know, I think about how can I continue to maybe even invest more money in 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 myself, in myself as a commodity there. And then, so that's really about the preparing part. And I think the action part, there's been some sprinkled in what I just said, but I think company level, company level. And, and this actually brings me to, if anyone has some good stories on this, I am all ears because of my next research project. So I think it is at the company level that we're going to see our greatest innovations and prepared and, and preparedness for an aging society, how to be resilient. So, you know, what are individual companies doing to think about, um, you know, Walmart has been making uh, headlines lately when they're kind of getting rid of college degree requirements to hire folks. That's actually an adaptation to population aging as well in my world. In my parlance, it is. They may be thinking of it for a different reason, but it is an adaptation to aging. And so, you know, I I think looking at your own company and thinking about how you can tweak that uh, is great. That's the place to be. I love it. Okay, so for our listeners, um, I'm going to put all of Dr. Shiva's in information in the description. The book is... 8 Billion and Counting, How Sex, Death, and Migration Shape Our World. It came out in 2022, and it's going to be relevant for maybe 20 years. Um, Her TED Talk, which you will want to watch, over 1 million views, uh, The Truth About Human Population Decline. I'll put that link there. And tell us about your newsletter, because I think newsletters are the best way to keep up with people. Yeah. And I use mine to learn new things Mm. personally or to organize information in new ways. It comes out every two weeks. It is free. And if people want to, you know, if we want to pay to subscribe because you're that kind of person and I'm surprised how many of them there are, um, you should do it. But it's our world of 8 billion. um, And that is on Substack. And so you actually can just Google my name and newsletter. I would put the link uh, link for them to to do that, which I think is great. And okay, what are you working on now, Jennifer? So my next book and research project grows out of the TED Talk, which is how do we develop this roadmap to resilience? And so that's where, you know, 8 billion and counting, that book was really data heavy. There's a lot of stories in there too, and you can skip around and read the story, you know, but this one is going to be much more focused on um, stories of how 
we can visualize like what are decisions actual people or companies or governments have made that have laid the foundation for resilience in an aging world. And so, you know, for example, I've become really interested in the state of Maine in the U.S. And that's because they have a median age of 45. So are they the Japan of the right. U.S.? You know, question mark there. Texas is still growing. The U.S. population is still growing. I'm sure there are some listeners who are like, I thought the U.S. was still growing. Yes, but not everywhere and not for much longer. And so, you know, I think I want to understand how we can have, what does it look like to have a resilient world um, that is greater and, when, and smaller? Do you know when the book's going to be? Oh, uh, I'm in right smack in the middle of writing it. And then, you know, once I finish, it's in a yeah. year after that. So I would love to say 2025, no. but frankly, it would probably be 26. Well, yeah. thank you for this incredible conversation and the work that you're doing, I think it's so vital and necessary. And it was so fun to sort of have my brain just blown open and see the world through your lenses. It's been incredible. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for paying attention to demography. A lot of people think it's going to be really boring, but isn't it? It's pretty exciting. Yeah, stuff, isn't it? it? Okay, Jennifer. Uh, well, when the new book's out, you'll come back and chat with us or maybe before that. All right. Thanks so much. Make sure to listen, follow, and subscribe for new episodes wherever you get your podcasts and on our YouTube channel.